Turn in your Bibles, please, to Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. We have studied together in recent days the transfiguration where Jesus went on the mountain with Peter, James, and John. We have looked at the situation that was occurring when they came down off that marvelous mountain with the boy that had the demon. Jesus teaches on faith, how important faith without doubting is. Today, I want us to look at, at this, the next lessons he's teaching here. The folly of fear in the presence of Jesus. Mark 9, 30 to 37. I hope you found that in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible with you, we'll have the text on the screen for you and would like to give you a Bible of your own. Stand with me if you would. And I want you to follow along as I read these verses from Mark 9, 30 to 37 in the English Standard Version. They went on from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he's killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. They came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent. For on the way, they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, or the idea not only me, but him who sent me. This is what? It is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May we be taught today that we need not fear asking Jesus, asking God about things we don't understand, nor do we need to fear when the scripture by the spirit or even through, through a precious person asks penetrating questions of us that would help us to grow in God. Thank you. Be seated. You know, it would be wonderful if, uh, if all we had to do was to be taught or told something once and we would have sufficient understanding to act decisively and competently on the matter. As, in fact, we, we, we kind of betray ourselves sometimes as parents and grandparents when we say, now I've already told you that once. I mean, as, as if we catch everything the first time, you know. <laughs> Be wonderful if life was like that, but it's not. Jesus had just taught his disciples concerning the importance of prayer and faith in facing the trials of, and challenges of life. And as he moves with them through Galilee and Capernaum, and we're told that he doesn't want anyone to know where they're going because he's got some, he's got some intense teaching to do with them. It's brief, but it's to the point. It's going to be the second time that the whole group, as a group of disciples, as the twelve, have heard him speak of his upcoming death, burial, and resurrection. It's the third time that Peter, James, and John have heard it because he mentions it to them coming off the Mount of Transfiguration. And it's interesting that his teaching again on his approaching death and resurrection provokes a collective fear in them. Perhaps a fear that they're going to lose their rabbi, their teacher, their leader, Perhaps a fear that what is going to befall him will befall them. And by the way, ultimately in history it did. And faith and fear cannot effectively dwell in the same heart and mind at the same time. And I would submit to you that that's where a lot of people live in battle. That's the cry of the father of the demonic 
demoniac child. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Faith and fear do not dwell effectively together in the heart and mind of the believer. There was an, an Indian tale told about a grandfather speaking to his grandson, and he was talking about the, the fighting anger, the child fighting anger. And he said, in your heart there is a good wolf and a bad wolf fighting. And the little boy said, well, which one wins, grandfather? And he said, the one you feed. The one you feed. And as followers of Jesus Christ, we must learn to feed faith and fight fear. We've talked about fear in recent days. It hadn't been that many sermons ago. We were looking at a passage where he was, he was calling upon them not to be afraid. We've, we've talked about that. Feed faith and fight fear. I would remind you of the passage we read last Sunday that the part of this, it leads into the study today from James in chapter 1 of James verses 5 and 6. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. Faith, no doubting. Faith with not fear. So as we look at this passage together today for a few minutes, we do well to remember that a, a fear of dread, and that's what the, the word that comes up, not only in our response of reading, stop being afraid, it's, it's the Greek word phobos. It's the word here that tells us they were afraid, that the fear of dread as a response to God and Jesus is a proper response for demons and sinners attempting to hide their sins, all right? Every time Jesus encounters demons in the New Testament, they have a dreadful fear of him, a terror of him. That's appropriate. And it should not surprise us that Adam and Eve in the garden, when they heard the voice of God after they had sinned and were hiding themselves, they feared him. And, and so it is today. John's gospel tells us that, that those who practice evil will not come to the light because their deeds are evil. They don't want to be exposed in the light. It's perfectly understandable that demons and sinners who are hiding their sins would have a fear of dread. But we also need to know that even in the presence of the glorified Jesus Christ, a follower of Christ, the apostle of John, who when he saw the voice... <laughs> It's interesting. When he saw the voice of him speaking, fell down at his feet as if dead. And the glorified Jesus Christ said, stop being afraid. Put his hand on him, stop being afraid. But that is Jesus' word to John, but it's Jesus' word to us. If we, have, if we have trusted in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and are living a life trusting in him, daily repenting of our sins and trusting in his finished work on the cross, he would say to us, stop being afraid. So I, want, I hope today that the Lord will convince us of the folly of fear when we live in the presence of Jesus. Look at the passage under three considerations. First, there's the fear in the face of Jesus' teaching, verse 30 to 32. Second, fear in the face of Jesus' testing. Then third, the folly of fear in the presence of Jesus. Let's unpack this quickly this morning. This fear in the face of Jesus' teaching is in verses 30 to 32. They, they went on from there and passed through Galilee and he did not want anyone to know. He's, it's, this public ministry is shifting a little bit where he's doing more private ministry, pouring himself into his followers. The time is approaching when he'll be taken from them. For he was teaching his disciples, verse 31, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. This, this fear in the face of his teaching. Now to be fair, Hebrews 6 verse, verse 2 uh, the prophet says, after two days, he will revive us. He's speaking of God. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. And you read that and you say, well, didn't they understand that teaching? Well, the, the rabbis had taught that 
to mean that this idea of third day meant eventually, ultimately. When you read this parallel passage in Matthew, Matthew adds some things about what Jesus said that makes it more pointed. But you would just need to know that they probably had the, the Hosea mindset in their backgrounds. This is the second time he has told them, plainly, he says, previously, he's going to die. He's going to suffer at the hands of the religious leaders. He's going to die. He's going to be crucified. He's going to rise again three days later. And they did not understand and were afraid to ask him. What a tragic situation to be in. It's okay not to understand. We're, when you become a follower of Jesus Christ, you don't become a genius. You don't become a first-rank theologian. One of my favorite personalities in the Gospel of John is the man born blind. He's, he's born blind. He's never seen anything in his life. Jesus comes to him, touches him. He, he opens his eyes and see. And, and Jesus says, do you believe in the Messiah? He says, if you, if you show him to me, I will. Then he's hauled into the chief, chief priest, and, and they say, now tell us, this, this man, he's got a demon, doesn't he? I mean, he's, he said, I, I, you tell me. You're the experts. I don't know. All I know is I couldn't see, and now I can. Then he says, why do you keep questioning me about him? Are you interested in becoming one of his followers too? He identifies himself as a follower of Jesus. They didn't understand. That's not wrong. They were afraid to ask him. anyone lacks wisdom, we just read in James, let him ask of God. Who does not upbraid us, who doesn't say, again, again you want to know? No, just the opposite. He gives us, he, he delights in giving us wisdom. He delights in giving us understanding. He delights in the relationship with him where, whereby we say, we don't know, we don't understand. I think far too many things in the Christian life, we just try to wing it. And we think it's so because we do it or we feel it. Rather than honestly standing and saying, I do not know. Lord, teach me. Because Jesus said he was going to leave and send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit would become our teacher. He would lead us into all truth. He would lead us. He's not going to drag us. Folks, the Christian life ought to be the life of a believer continually in prayer saying, Lord, teach me. Teach me to pray. Teach me to care. Teach me to love. Like, teach me to have your heart with other people. Teach me to delight in your word. Teach me to delight in your day. Teach me to delight in the people of God. Teach me, Holy Spirit. Wouldn't it have been wonderful if they had had the faith to say, Jesus, what do you mean? Here's the deal. He knew anyway. He knew anyway that they didn't understand. He knew anyway that they were terrified. What, what, wouldn't it have been great to say, Jesus, what do you mean? Tell me. I, I, we want to know. I, I want to understand every word that comes out of your mouth. I, I want it worked into my heart. So you have this, this fear at his teaching. Folks, Jesus says some hard things in the Gospels. You know, come after me, deny yourself. Take up your cross. The cross is an instrument of death. We read that and we go, wow, what does that mean? I promise you, our brothers and sisters in Christ in Iraq and Syria, Iran, and today, Somalia, to India, they don't misunderstand that. Yet they need not fear it either. One of the stories about the 12 who were recently executed, there was, a, there was a group of women who were taken out and executed, and they were beheaded. And one of the women, they were all confessing Christ as they came to the end. But one of the women lifted up just because they say they make them bow their heads so they can get a good clean cut on the beheading. And just as they were about to execute her, she looked up and said, Jesus. <laughs> Almost as if, she, like Stephen, she saw Jesus. Standing, waiting for her. Jesus. See, his teaching can be hard. And we do our best 
Not when we shirk back from it, not when we pretend it's not there, but when we say, Lord, teach me this. I, I want to know this. Paul, Paul, who had suffered all kinds of persecution, said, I want to know him. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know what it, be, what it means to be made conformable to his death. There's also the fear in the taste, face of Jesus testing it. Verses 33 to 34, they came to Capernaum. So now they've, they've, they've journeyed through Galilee un, unnoticed. They've come to Capernaum. They're in the house. He sits down and teaches them again. And he says this, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent. For on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. So, so now their fear is that they don't want the topic on the table to be discussed. Now one of the commentators said that probably what you have to understand is that the way they would have been walking, the, the teacher the, would, would have always walked ahead. They would never have presumed to cluster around him. They would have walked behind him. And in walking behind him, there would have been this, this dynamic of the pecking order. Who, who gets to walk immediately behind him? Who, who is farther and farther behind? And the, the, probably there was this ongoing, why do you get to walk there? Why, you were there? why don't I ever get to walk up there? Just this back and forth. And that's what was going on. Jesus could hear it, but he didn't need to hear it. He knew what was in the hearts of men, the thoughts of men. And so he asked them at the, at, when he's sitting down with them in the house, what were you discussing? They were, they were embarrassed. They were ashamed. They were fearful that he would find out. But the funny thing is he knew. And they should have known that he knew. They'd been with him in circumstances where people in the crowd might be murmuring and he would say, why are you saying among yourselves? And he would repeat to them what they'd been saying. His testing. He's testing them here. Oh, wouldn't it have been wonderful if somebody said, well, I'm ashamed to admit it, Master, but I was fussing because I didn't like my spot in the walk. I want to be... Now, they could have said it very piously. Well, Jesus, I just want to be closer to you. He will test us, folks. Sometimes he will send people into our lives who will ask us the, the piercing question, the penetrating question. And we dare not shirk back from it or shrink back. And sometimes we're reading his word and the word comes to us. We were in our Disciple Making 101 yesterday morning and there was a collection of videos that, was, that we watched that were just so humbling. We're going to show some of them to you in the morning services in the future just to so humbling, piercing. But that's okay. If you want to follow Jesus Christ, it's good to be pierced. If I have an inflated ego, it's good for that ego to be deflated. If I have a wrong view of myself, a high <laughs> view of myself, that needs to be humbled and brought down because here's what he does. It's He shows them the folly. Here's, here's the thing that's important to me. They're acting childishly. So look at verses 35 to 37. He sat down. Now, he's, they've had the meal. He asked them the question. They kept silent. He knows what the answer is. Doesn't bring it up yet. So after the meal, he sat down and called the 12 and said, if anyone would be first, let him, he must be last of all, serve of all. And he took a child, there was a child nearby. Now the picture that we have is that he was able to take this child in the crook of his arm. We're talking about a little child, a baby, baby, a toddler maybe. He takes this child in the crook of his arm and puts them in the midst of them and says, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. Whoever receives me, receives not me, but him who sent me. They were acting childishly. He, he shows them childlikeness, the beauty of childlikeness. He'd ask them, what were you discussing in the way? They were afraid to tell him. So after supper, he says, you want to be first. 
be last. We go on our walk tomorrow. Rather than fighting and fussing to get up closest to me, why don't you say, no, you go ahead of me. No, no, you go ahead of me. You, no, you go. You go ahead of me. Be last. You want to be the greatest purpose not to fuss with others, but to serve others, serve everyone else. Childishness won't do. Childlikeness is the call. Just watch children sometime. Oh, they can be, they can be cruel. They can also be some of the kindest people, most unassuming people. Come to you and say, so-and-so looked, looked mean at me. It's okay, you'll get over it, deal with it. And five minutes later, what are they doing? They're playing with so-and-so. They haven't filed a grievance. So-and-so pulled my hair. So-and-so pushed me down. Five minutes later, they and so-and-so are just having the time of their lives. See, parents and adults teach children to hold grudges. They don't, they don't know how to do that. We're the ones that teach them. Parents and children are, children are colorblind to people. Parents have to teach them not to be. Jesus says, my kingdom, my kingdom is like little children. You see, they were fussing about who would be the greatest, and Jesus puts a child in their midst, and, and, and it would offend them to suggest that the child was really greater than any of them because the child was in the way as far as they were concerned. He would teach us, folks, that it's foolish to fear. Whether we're fearing what we read in the Word, what we're fearing what some pastor, some Bible study teacher teaches us, it's foolish to fear if it comes from God, if it comes from Jesus. It's for our good and for His glory. And all things work together for good to those who love Him, who are called according to His purpose. We've talked with people recently who have children who are struggling, adult children who are struggling. How could a good God let such and such happen. And it's our responsibility to live before them to show them that we, we trust a good God, a holy God, a loving God, a sovereign God. Even in the face of great trial, and tribulation, and tragedy, and teach that, model that. We do not fear. The Lord is my helper, the Hebrew writer said. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. When it comes from Jesus, we need not fear it. Dietrich Bonhoeffer sat in a German prison during World War II, and he, said, he wrote, when Christ bids a man to follow him, he bids him come and die. And we ought to say to people who say, I want to, I want to be baptized, I want to follow Jesus, are you willing to die for him? Well, what's that got to do with it? It's got everything to do with it. You may not be called upon to die for him, but are you willing to die for him? who lived for you and gave his life for you. It's a discussion that needs to be had. His testing should not be despised when trials come. We need to learn to embrace them by faith and say, Lord, I don't understand this. I, I don't know how in the face of everything else this is happening, but, I, but here's what I do know. I'm not, I'm not going to fear on the basis of what I don't know. I'm going to trust in who I do know. So real quickly before we go, three lessons from this passage. First, never be afraid or hesitant to ask the Lord for understanding of a matter for which you lack judgment. Never be afraid. Ne In other words, the devil would say, well, you ought to know that by now. No, I'm just going to be like a child. Lord, I, I know you've taught me this before. <laughs> I need to understand again. I need to understand. He is more willing to give us understanding than we are willing to ask for it. That's what you've got to know. If you being evil know how to give good things to your children when they ask, how much more will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask you? 
The Holy Spirit who is sent here to be our teacher, who will lead us into all truth, who will teach us all things. Never be afraid to ask. Second lesson. Never fear the searching questions of Jesus that come to us through his word and his spirit. They're designed to help us search our hearts and discover those thoughts and attitudes that do not belong in the life of his disciples. What were you talking about in the way? It wasn't because he didn't know. He was wanting to expose to them the childishness and to root that out of them because it would not stand them well when the heat would be turned up on them, the heat of persecution. Third, Fear is childish, while a heart of humble service is the childlike mark of true greatness in the kingdom Jesus is building. Learn to make a distinction. We have to make it as parents. Is what just happened, is that just come, does that flow out of childlikeness or is that, or is that childishness? It's one thing to spill a glass of milk. It's another thing to, in anger, knock over a glass of milk. Fear is childish. Faith is childlike. Trusting Jesus. I've told you before, we told you in some of our classes, we must develop a mindset, a way to think as Christians. One fellow wrote, thinking Christianly, where we're not locked into that which is purely, in our minds, logical, nor casting in categories that that we don't understand as illogical, there is a path of biblical thinking, biblical reasoning, where when truth revealed in Scripture is set before us, we learn to think like that, even if, if naturally we would think it is illogical. The last will be first and the first will be last. Where does that make sense? In the kingdom of God. God will come and die for you and rise again. Where does that make sense in the kingdom of God? A woman who's never known a man intimately will bear a child. Where does that make sense in the kingdom of God? You see, when we learn to think biblically, then, then we don't make the leap of if then. We learn to reason biblically and say if then because. Fear is childish. When we discover it in ourselves, we need to recognize it is a mark of immaturity. We ought to pray, dear God, whatever it takes, whether it's, whether it's the washing of your word, whether, whether a, a more intimate prayer life, being mentored by a more mature believer, whatever means, Lord, help me to ferret out of my life Fear, And when I find it popping its head up, help me to cut it off like a weed in my garden. Fear is childish. And Lord, help me not, not to be so big and so wise. Help me to be childlike. Help me to never move beyond that childlikeness that, that the, the little prophet in the Old Testament. Speak, Lord, for I am your servant and I will hear. Jesus rejects childishness. He exposes it with his testing. And he promotes childlikeness as the path of greatness in the kingdom he is building. Oh, don't fall into the folly of fear. Particularly when you live in the presence of Jesus. We need to learn increasingly that... When we find ourselves weary, the world has made us weary. When, when circumstances trouble us, when it seems to be dark around us, we need to learn, as Josh said earlier, to gaze upon Jesus, who he is, what he came to do, to see him in his word, magnificent and lovely. And the things of, of earth that we struggle with, 
they dim. When you, when you get a full-faced, undistracted gaze of the beauty of Jesus Christ, who he is for you, his glory and his grace, as John said, we, we beheld him and we beheld his glory. It was a glory that could only be explained in terms of having come from the Father and he, Jesus, was full of grace and truth. That's what life in Christ, that's what life on this earth until we're taken home to heaven, that's what it's to be about. Wherever you are today, whatever you're facing, uncertainty about your health, uncertainty about your finances, uncertainty about your relationships, you have two choices. You can fear or you can trust. And those two things don't live well together. One's got to give way to the other. Let's bow together.